Now we'll go into loops, conditions, and functions. So I will just comment all this out real quick and get started. So uh, before we hop into functions, let's talk about a few more things. So there's when we create a variable equals one, for example, um, there's some tools in Python that are kind of nice. If you want to do a equals a plus something or a equals a times something, a shortcut for this is instead of a equals a plus, you do a plus equals and then whatever you would have over here, uh, if it was like a equals a plus five, you do a plus equal five and they'll do the exact same thing. A equals a times two, you can just a times equal two. Uh, you can do the same with minus and divide. So a minus or uh, divide equal two, divide by two, a minus equal five would subtract five from a. So those are some additional quick ways to do arithmetic. Now, next, let's talk about dealing with classes. So we created lists before. So let's look, close this out and create a new shell. Okay, so we, we created a list before. Let's create one now. My list is on five. This, I can access certain properties and functionality of this class. Because if I look at type of this, it's a list, right? So when I look at the class, I can do my list is dot. And then if I click tab, I can see a bunch of different options here. And these are things that come with list. So for example, I could append. And append is a function for a list, and it just will put at the end of your list whatever you select here. So if I wanted six, for example, at the end of my list, if I pull up my list, it now has six at the end of it. So if you ever need to perform some operation on a class, often you can uh, do period and then see whatever operation here and then this will allow you increased functionality and often you can find what you need there now this is the period operator right so list three and add with dot append four Another thing we can do when working with lists is using functions. So some things we may want to do are if I look at the max, I can find the maximum value in the list. So I find this with max of my list. Max, open parenthesis, my list, it's my variable, close parenthesis. So I can print this out. We could also print the minimum and a uh, very useful one with lists is length, which is L-E-N. So right now my list is one, two, three, four. So I should expect four here. And if I run this in test now, oh, length four list. Okay, I get 414. So the max in my list is 4, the min in my list is 1, and the length of my list is 4. So these are some of the main ones. A few more are some. This will just add up everything in a list. And we could also create lists. So if you want to have a list that goes 1, 8, 9, 10, for example. So it just starts at some number, ends at some number, and goes in increments of one. 
an easy way to do this is with range and you can just put in the stop or you can put in the start and then stop separated by a comma so it's two and then you can also do start stop and step so if we just did stop we printed this out it'll just say range of zero ten but if i want to see like the first value in this let's say a is range of zero or just range of ten and it'd say a at zero so it starts at zero and with lists you can find zero is start to get to the end you actually do minus one and minus one is just saying well zero is the first position subtract one go and circle around to the final position so minus one is end and this is nine so when i say range to 10 it goes 10 minus one it stops before it gets to the 10. so range of 10 is 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9. c a 1 1 a of 2 it's 2 and so on you can also go when i'm calling up a list i can call up multiple positions in it and the way it works is it starts at the starting position and then there's a colon and then you give it the position you want it to stop before so if you say the end position minus one it'll go from the start zero to the position right before the last and then if my end is minus one i can do this and it'll just show range of zero nine because it stops before ten or the minus one because that's the end if i try to do a at nine i'll get nine a at ten there is not one so a of zero one will just be zero and one a zero nine we range zero nine and a zero and will be ten a of zero eleven will also be ten so with the brackets and the colon i can call up multiple positions within the matrix if i had just a normal matrix a is let's say b or five just so we know exactly what it is so it's not range b bracket zero colon minus one includes all but the final value so with the minus colon minus one if i just do minus one it'll be five but if i do colon minus one it stops before the final one that's why we got we did zero colon minus one up here it'll stop right before it actually gets to the minus one position so to get to the full one you can just do a of zero colon and if you don't feed in a number here it will just uh, go to the end and i could do a of one colon would be from one to the end and so on so that's how if you want to go from a certain position you go position and just a colon whereas if you want to start colon position end you actually have to do position end plus one because as i said it stops at the position end so if you want to include it you need to go one past it so this is the range and this is how to actually call up positions in it if i wanted uh five six seven eight nine ten i do range five eleven or let's say c is range of five and say c uh and you can just do a colon if you have no start and no stop so you want to just include all of it it's five to ten and length of c is five so if i wanted c at 
5, I would do minus 1. So if it's a length 5, it's 4, the position. And that's actually why it is set up like this, to have the number after the colon be past the stopping point. And that's just because if you wanted to go for the full span, you could do that very easily. Obviously, just colon will do it, but you can do it with zero colon C. And then that just makes it so that you can include all of them because you don't have to do length of C minus one because it stops before length of C. And length of C is five, so it'll stop at four, which because of the way it calls it up, will be our last position. So hopefully that makes sense. Let's do one more example. Let's say D is 7, 9, 11, 13, 15. So in steps of 2 instead, the way we can do this is A is range of start, 7, stop, 15, and increments of two. If I print and I convert E to a list, so I take list of E and then print that out, I get seven, nine, 11, 13. And so to get this, to include the 15, I'd have to do 15 plus one plus two. And then when I print, list V, it will include the 15. So an important thing to realize when you're using range, you have to make it go past the point at which you want it to stop. And then we could look at just 7, 9, 11 with, let's just make E a list for simplicity's sake. So when I see it, it's not a range. And then I could see the first two in in E by saying zero colon two, and then it'll go zero, one, and then stops as it gets to the two. So it'll do seven, nine. If I wanted to include 11, 13, then I would do zero, one, two, and one, two, three, four. And then I've got my 11, 13. So that's how we can call that up. Of course, to just include everything past nine we do e two colon and then no matter how big this was it would just have all of them including and past the second position so zero one two everything past that so that's creating lists a little bit more on it and accessing positions and lists so now let's talk about libraries so with Python, there's lots of libraries that you can add on to provide additional functionality. The main one we'll look at now is math. So to do things like trigonometric functions, to handle rounding easy, different things like that, you can do the math. And there are a couple options here. You can import math. And what happens then is you can do math dot and this will give you access to the functions that come with math. So for example, if I wanted sine, you can either scroll down or I can just type in sin, which is the name for calling up a sinusoidal function. Math.sine will expect radians, and you can expect this with most of the functions in Python and most programming languages. Typically it wants it in radians. So if I wanted sine of pi, I would do 3.14, right? It's out. Show how this is working. Run this. The sine of 3.14 is about zero. And we see it's 0 0.00159. And an interesting thing here is with math, it also includes pi. So math.pi. But this is just a value, not a function. So I don't have to include parentheses. I just have math.pi. And compared to the math.sign, where I include the parentheses and then put something in it because it's a function. So if I run this, I'll see it's a very small number because it prints it out in scientific notation. So 
So it's 1.22 times 10 to the negative 16. So it's very small, but it's not zero. And that's because this function isn't going to perfectly calculate. First of all, we don't have all the digits pi because we can only store so much information on the computer. When, when you work with pi, you know that sine of pi is zero, but it doesn't actually know this is pi. It just knows a bunch of digits. And when it calculates that out, it only gets so accurate. And so you have to be aware that when you're doing calculations like this, uh, Python will only get you so close. This is a limitation with most programming languages. You could also do sine of zero, which wouldn't have the problem of math.py not having all the digits. So that gets us right on. So it works, uh, works pretty good. We can also do so that's sine with sin, cosine with cos, tangent with tan, and then to do inverse, so inverse sine, inverse cosine, inverse tangent, you can do a sine, which is the old notation for it, and it's just carried over into existing programming languages. So a sine, a cosine, a tangent. Now there's lots of other things and we saw when this if I type math dot and then press tab it'll give me all these things and these are all of the functions in here and if you wanted to figure out what what radiance does for example uh you could just look it up the internet is a great tool especially with python there's so much documentation online for you to find out but i'll just explain Radiance converts degrees to radians, and degrees converts radians to degrees. So if I did math dot degrees dot pi, I'll get 180, right? Because pi in radians to degrees is 180. And another thing is functions like logarithms, right? So the way we can do logarithms is we have the natural logarithm and log base 10 are what we often deal with so we all use that is math.log and whatever i feed in math.log is a natural logarithm as you may have seen when i type this it says log x comma base equals math.e so math.e is the natural value natural logarithm is base e. So by default, it does math.e. If you wanted another, right here is whatever you're taking the log of, and then the base is math.e, or say you want it to be base 10, whatever you just have included. So for example, log base 10 of 10 is 1. Log base e of E, and because it's by default f.e, I can just get rid of that and it will be one as well. So that's logarithms. We also have like factorial, you can just type in factorial for that. There's also rounding. So if I look at math, dot, if I type in r, it doesn't show round. Um, it does show remainders, so we can figure out the remainder of something. But one way to do rounding is with, look up a little further, sill is to round up and floor is to round down. So if I did after sill of 1.2, it'll be 2. It's just rounding up. Uh, there's a built in function round that just does what you might expect round of 1.2 1 whereas round of 1.5 is 2 so it'll round in whichever direction so that's dot sill dot floor turn down and round to just round in general okay um and with this the way we worked here is we specified import math and then we can do math dot whatever if we wanted to include only specific functions from math, 
the way we could do that is we could say from math import and then say whichever ones we want to include. So if we wanted to just include sine cosine tangent pi, then as this is, it will import sine cosine tangent and pi from math and it'll just put it as sine. So you don't have to do math.sign or math.log included log e. Now I could do sine of pi and print it out. And I get sine of pi again, but I didn't have to do math.sign of math.pi. So it makes it a little easier sometimes to do that. You can also, but this is not recommended, you can from math import everything. This is something you wanna be really careful with because it can have lots of things inside it. So typically you wanna just call up the things you want, but if you do do the asterisk star there, then that will include everything you want. And usually, you want to, at the very top of your file, just do all your imports. So if you're going to import stuff from math, do it up at the top, and then you can use it later after you've done that. But yeah, typically you want everything you're importing at the top of your file before you define any variables or anything like that. Okay, so that's importing math and using a couple of things with it. Now we can go on to functions. Functions are when you want to have multiple operations in one thing. So if you wanted to do several calculations in a row on something, then you could put that in a function. There's conditionals that will go into after. This is if you only want to do certain things in certain cases, so where the program can make a decision. You could also do loops. This is when you want to circle back and do the same thing again. So let's go through each of these. So first, let's go into functions. And as we said, functions are about creating an automated operation. So like if you want it to be able to calculate sine, this is a function. So you give it some input and it just returns the sine for that input. So if I wanted to create my own function, the way I do that is DEF, short for define, and then you give your function name. And this is basically the same like a variable name. Uh, so you want to be really careful. Any functions you have defined that you don't make a variable equal to something, make it equal to just a constant or something because it will override the function or just give you problems in general. And then you can say open parenthesis and whatever the name you want input one to be internal to the function, whatever the name you want to be for input two, input three, and so on. And then you have a colon. As you can see with idle, when I entered here, it automatically tapped it in. And that's because with Python, with organization of things like functions, it uses indentation to figure out what's inside the function. So whatever I have indented, here is inside the function. When I unindent, it ends it. So right here, if I were to pull up the name and give it, let's say input one is 10, input two is 15, input three is 30. I could then call it up because I'm now out of my function because I'm not tabbed in anymore. And I'm after where I defined the function. So Let's say we want to do some operations. So val one is input one times two. Two is input one. Or input two plus eleven. And val three is input three divided by fifty-five. Then whatever I want to come out of this function, and let's say I just want the three inputs. I can return, and return is a keyword. Anytime something changes color, it means it's means something to MATLAB. So you want to not use like return or DEF as a 
variable name. But let's say we want to just return a list with val1, val2, val3. Now, anytime I call this function, uh, whatever I send in as input1 will, to the function, look like input1 as it starts, and then whatever I send in, input2 will look like input2, input3 will be input3. So as I call this up, when I refer to the function, it doesn't matter what I put into here. It just sees whatever values. So if I like say val1 is 15, then I could put in val1 here instead of 15, and it'll work the same. Because the function will just look at whatever the value of this variable is, and then put it in for input 2. And how I defined val1 in here and out here, for the function, the only variables it sees are the inputs. So when I create a new variable val1, val2, val3, these aren't going to be defined later. If I tried to print out val2, it'll give me an error because val2 is only within the function. When I finish the function, so when I call it up, I first say input1 is 10, input2 is 15, and input 3 is 30. Then I calculate val1 is 2 times input 1, and calculate val2 and val3. And then I return whatever val1 is as the first position in a list, and then val2 second position, val3 third position. And then it like forgets all of these, because all it does is returns these values. So whatever I want this to equal, equal val, equals function name of 10, 15, 30. And when I try and call up the val2, it'll give an error because equal val is the only thing I got out of this function. And that's whatever I return. So if I save it, run it, got errors, which is a good sign. And I can look at equal val, which is 20. That's of course 10 times two. And you could make sure val two and three were calculated correctly, but it gave no problem. If I tried to call up val two, val two is not defined, even though it's defined in the function, because we're outside of the function. Whereas val one, it wouldn't be 10 times two, it wouldn't be the 20 that I calculated, it'll be the 15. So hopefully that makes sense with functions. and let this out and real quick to note as well whenever I get to the return anything after it even if it's tabbed in if I were to say val 1 plus equals 11 here it would not matter because it will already have return right so anything after the return once it gets to this point is going to be ignored now on to a more useful example of a function. So let's say we wanted to define a function that computes the average in a list. And maybe we want to shorten it to AVG because we're going to use it a lot. So we want to just type AVG instead of average every time we want to use it. So AVG, and then whatever I want the name of my first input to be called in this function, doesn't matter, it's just something to make sense. So let's just call this my list. And I'll just use this function with list inputs. But of course, this is just a name. I could feed in a number to this. It wouldn't matter for the actual variable name. Now I want it to return to calculate the average. I want to add up everything in my list and then divide it by however many elements are in my list, right? That's how you compute the average. So with lists, we can do this with sum of lists and then divide that by length list. And now let's run this. If I were to do ABG of six, it'll be four because the average of this list is four. So it makes it really useful if you're going to have to compute the average of lots of lists, you can just do a function 
that you create with a definition and then use that forever after. So, here. 15, 30, 31, 30, print this out. It's after in my code, the average function. The average of those is 25.3333. Let's say we want another function. And this is, instead of sign of radians, I want the sign of degrees. Then I can create my own function and say the input, I'm just going to call it DEG, which are for degrees. And when I get my input, I want to turn math.sin math.degree. And if you couldn't remember, for example, if it was degree or degrees, if you press tab, then it will either list a bunch of options, or if there's only one option, it will autofill. So there was only one option and it auto filled it to degrees. So I know that's right. And it's not about degrees of DEG. Or sorry, I want to convert degrees to radians. So I'll do math.radians of my degree and then math.sign of that. So if I were to want print out the sign degrees of 50 or let's say 90 degrees. Oh, uh, that will give us an error because we didn't import math. We imported sine, cosine, tangent, pi, log, and e from math. So I want sine and I didn't import radians. So I'll just do the quick calculation myself. I'm gonna multiply by pi and divide by 180. Now, if I do this, uh, the sine of the degrees 90 will be 1. Sine degrees of 45 will be 0 0.707, just as I'd suspect. So that's another example of a function you might want. Just lets you compute the sine of degrees instead of radians. And you'd probably want to, instead of actually typing this out, you probably want to pick a shorter name. That's why with AVG, I just shorten it to AVG. Uh, maybe I want sin D, and this is, this is a common name with uh, programming languages to do sin D for sine and degrees. Now let's look at one more function. And this one, I want to just make a function that adds things together. And because sum is actually a function, I don't want to override it. So I'm going to say summation instead. So I'll call it in one, two, I'm going to say in three as well. And I just want to add these together. So I, let's say I want to calculate it before I return it. So calc and just make a variable is in one plus in two plus three. Then I want to return that calc because I'm tapped in, I tap it again, and then I'm done. Remember, it's very important that you're actually indented and that it matches. So if I had these both indented, but they didn't match, it would give me problems. So you want to make sure after you define, now you indent a certain amount, and then you are consistent matching that until you do your return and are finished and unindented. So if I want to do summation now, it takes in three inputs, and let's say we want to add 5 to 13 to 12. It'll do 5 plus 13 is 18, plus 12 is 30. Perfect. And this is how we can do multiple inputs, but a nice tool in Python is that you can easily make it so that certain inputs have default values. So if I wanted to maybe only sometimes use all three, and sometimes I just want to add two values together, then I could just say, by default, make in three zero. And then if they don't feed in three, if they just feed in two, for example, the five and 13, they just get to 18. And then I don't have to put in third input. If I didn't put this equal, like, because I haven't run this, the function is the old one here, so I can 
try it. Summation 513. It would be an error because it's missing when required input in three. But when I do in three equals zero, I save, I run. Now, same thing. Summation 513. Well, will give me the same thing just fine because it will only equal the zero if I don't give it something. But I can say summation of 513 now, and that will just be the 18. So that's a nice thing when you're creating functions and set default values. Python requires that everything after you first give a default value gives default values because it doesn't know. For example, if you had it like this, then if you just gave three inputs here, would it be three inputs as in you're feeding in one, in two, in four, or are you feeding in one, in two, in three, and it should give you an error because it didn't get an in four. So the way it works is every time after the first default value is another default value. And then it just goes in and so if I wanted to add the other one here, I just add it and loop space or not where I've got this, I can either define two, I can define three, or I can define four. And it will just take in, in three, if I feed in three, will be whatever the third one is. In two will always be the second, in one will always be the first. So that's creating a function and you can give it default values. And you just call it up by whatever name you've got, the thing that's highlighted in blue here, and then give it open parentheses and whatever inputs you want. You can feed in a variable and it'll just feed that value into your function and make the first input be equal to that, whatever you define this variable to be. Or you can feed in just a number or whatever value instead. Either way, it works totally fine. Now let's go into conditions. The way conditions work is they just let the computer make a decision. So let you differentiate between certain things. So, so far we've dealt with numbers. So for example, like an integer one, uh, float 1.3. We've dealt with strings. Now we're going into Booleans and instead of 1, 2, 15, 1 million, whatever you may want for a number, Booleans are just true or false. So the way we can do this is we can just type in capital true, and you'll notice if I do lowercase true, it doesn't work. I have to do capital true. That equals true, of course. False equals false. But it's not like a string. If I just type something in as if it's a string, then it won't be recognized. True and false are specifically, they're like a number one or a number zero, right? It just is a value. So true and false are values. You don't want to say true equals something. It'll give you an error because you can't use that as a variable name just because it's kept as a keyword in Python. So with the booleans, we got true, we got false, in order to use this in a manner that will actually make it so that the computer can make decisions, right? It's not just I tell it if it's true or false. I can do comparison operators. And let's say I've got my string check, and this is a specific color. So let's say I feed in red. I want to check, this will be my variable check color, and I want it to be true if the string check is blue, for example. The way I do this is I do string check, and I say equals equals, and this isn't like the single equal. With the single equal, it's just setting the variable on the left equal to the value on the right here. But with equal equal, it's just saying it's checking if it's true or false that it does equal. So if I wanted to check it equals blue, I say check color, whatever I want to be equal to true or false, equals string check equals equals blue. 
And this will, of course, be false. So when I run this type color, I get a false. If I had type red in here, I would get zero. Right? So that makes sense. Uh, with numbers, we may also want to check if a number is greater than another number. So um, one is 15, um, two is 11. And we want check number. We want it to be true if num1 equals num2. We can do that just like we did it with a string. Of course, this will be false, my check color or check number. Number will be false, but other comparison operators are equal equal we got greater than we got less than we got less than or equal to greater than or equal to and not equal to so if i wanted to check if number one is greater than number two then i just run this and now check number just run that check number is true because number one is greater than number two so yeah, if I run this again, I'll just get val. It's not. So these are all my operators. Again, you just use the single equal to define a variable to give it some value and use the comparison operators to check if something's true or false. So I can just do one equals equals zero, be false. One equals equals one will be true. One is not equal zero will be true. 3 is greater than 2 will be true, 3 is less than 2 will be false, all that. So these are our comparison operators. Now the next thing we want to maybe do is combine. So I want, let's say, to check if two things are true. The way you can do this is with an AND. And AND just checks, are all of the things true? So if I say true, true, and true, and true, and false, it'll be false, right? Because one of these is not true. So it'll say true and true. That gives us a true. So true, true, false. And then the true and true is again the true. So we get true and false here, simplified but true and false, one of these is false, so we get false. And of course you can feed in whatever comparisons in here. So we can have one is equals one, and one is less than zero. If I run this, I get a false. And you can include parentheses. So if I wanted one equals equals one, and one is less than zero, and then Instead of and, I want an or. And this is the pipe. It's the shift slash on your keyboard. Uh, it's probably by the backspace, either right under it or right to the left. Depends exactly on the keyboard. But it's a vertical line. And this means or. So if I wanted one equals one and one is less than zero or three is greater than 11, then. With the parentheses, it'll do nothing because it's just around the entire expression. But this will be false because it'll say one is one and one is less than zero. This is false. Or three is greater than 11. This is false. But if I did a true at the end here, the 12 is greater than 11 would be true because it does the first check one equals one and one is less than zero. This is not true because this is true, but this is not. So true and false is a false. And then does false or true. And because one of those is true, it returns true. Now, if we look here, we can see an example of where order of operations would matter with Booleans. So you can have a true or false and true and false, which as you can see becomes false. Whereas true or, and then parentheses, false and true and false 
will give you a true because the first one is true. So it doesn't matter order of operations and parentheses in Booleans. Right now we've only been able to see things. How do we make it actually do something based upon what it sees? Well, this is with a if statement. And with an if statement, you just say if, and it's like def, it's a keyword here in Python. So you couldn't name a variable if. And we say if, and we want a condition. So let's say if bar one is less than 50. Let's just say bar one is 11. So it is less than 50. And I do a colon, enter. It would automatically indent it just like the definition. And once again, all of the indented will only be included in the if. So if indent and let's say print bar one is less than 50. If I run this, I get bar one is less than 50. If I change this to 51, then it does not print out bar one is less than 50 because that effectively switched it to if true, true to if false. And then if only runs if the thing it's checking is true. So that's how we can actually make a decision in Python. But there's a couple of other things we can do with an if. That's the basic, but we can add things on. So if bar one is less than 50, if we print bar one is less than 50. If we want it to check something else in addition to this, but only if bar one is not less than 50, we can do an else if, and you can turn this to elif, and this will check another condition with whatever we want. So if var1 is not less than 50, because it'll only check the other option here, the else if, if this is not met. So let's say we have a var2, and this is less than 50, this is 30. Then we can check if var2 is less than 50, and we print var2 is less than 50. And we could go on, we could add more else ifs, and it'll just keep going. It'll say, if this, then do this. Otherwise, if that's not true, then if this is true, do this. Otherwise, with another else if, we'd have another condition. If all the stuff above wasn't true, but this is, then do it. Another else if, if all the stuff above wasn't true, but this is, then do it, so on. Then at the end, you can choose to include an else, and else will just say, if everything above wasn't true, then do this always. So it doesn't check another condition, it just does it no matter what. And you always include an if, and then you can include a bunch of else ifs if you want, or just one, two, three, four, however many you want. And you can then also include an else at the end if you like. These are both optional. So then you could print bar one is not less than 50 and bar two is not less than 50. If I run this, it'll say bar two is less than 50 because bar one is not. If I change this to 40, then when I run it, var1 is less than 50, and it printed it out because I have this one, so I'll comment it out so it doesn't print it out twice. But now if I run this, var1 is less than 50, right? Uh, if I make it equal to 50, it's no longer, and then we can do var2 is less than 50, because even though var2 was less than 50 both times, it stopped immediately right here when we have found var1 is less than 50. And then, if neither of them were less than 50, then we'll print out var1 is not less than 50 and var2 is not less than 50. So that's if, else, if, else. And we can do more than print. We would say if var2 is less than 50, then var2 is var2 times 2, for example. We could do something like that. And if var1 is 50, we could do whatever we want. We can run code in here just like normal. It just all has to be indented, just like the function. And 
unlike a function, whatever's in the if is running in this main thing. So if I were to change var2 here, var2 will be changed. So var2 is 50, or that's only if I get in here. So let's put it in the else, because that's where we're going to right now. That's tr actually happening. So now var2 will be 100, because it said var2 is var2 times 2, and var1 is 50. So because we got to this part in the code, we ran it and did the print. So that's how conditionals work. We just let Python pick if it wants to actually run some section of code. And it's based all upon these booleans. You can also use the function bool, that's short for boolean, and that'll just convert a number to a boolean. And the way it'll work is, as you can see, if it's zero, it'll be false, and all of the numbers will be true. If I did bool with negative one, it'll also be true. So zero is the one that's false, all the other numbers will be true. And for that reason, you can do if a, where a is equal to one, and the if will just run. This is effectively saying bool of a, right? Because it's not a boolean, it's just a numerical value. So converts it to a boolean. So whatever that would return, if that's true or false, then that's what you would get. Let's create a function with conditionals. So the way we can do this is we can create a function. We can say is grt than two inputs a and b and let's make a variable this will be the boolean true or false and a greater than b we would want to let's say print out if if a is greater than b then we can do use c because that's checking if a is greater than b if c then print string of a which is whatever number we specify for a so let's use an input equals input. So I'll print string of a plus is when I add strings together, it just puts them as one part. And then is greater than space to give it space before the number string of b. Now, after the if, turn C. And then C, it'll return true or false, but it'll also print out uh, whatever the first input is, is greater than whatever the second input is, if it's not true. If I want it to also print out that it's not greater than, then of course I could do that with this. Just change it to is not greater than. Now if I run it, it's waiting for an A. That's why it's blank. It just did the input with nothing in it. So let's say A is 10 and B is, let's say I want A to be greater than B. So B is five. It didn't print it out because the function has inputs A and B, but it doesn't care about outside A and B are defined this way. I need to actually call up is DRT then, and then, not in the definition, but in the actual calling up of the function, use the variables a and b. So, call this test, save and run, and now I'll have a b10, b b5. Because I called it up, it actually went through and ran the function with my a and b. So, c is 10 greater than 5, so c is true. Right. So, say if true. So we'll do what's inside this indent. Then I'll print 10 is greater than 5. But it didn't do that. And why is the question? Because if I do is GFT 10, 11. I should say 10 is not greater than 11, which is true. But when I do is then 11, 10, does 11 is greater than 10. So why did it do that is the question. 
because the working in here is GRT then and four three is greater than five is not greater than so let's see here and the false is of course just because they returned C which is false so let's see if we run this if I just right here made A is 15, B is 10, 15 is greater than 10, good. But you input 15, 10, 15 is greater than 10. So 10 is not greater than 5. Let's try this one more time with 10 and 5. Whoops. 10, 5. 10 is not greater than 5. This is a difficulty with Python because when I just typed in the number right here, when I defined the variable, it worked just fine. But when I use input, it doesn't. Why is this? Well, it's because it's checking if the string 10 is greater than the string 5, which is false. Why that is? You don't need to worry about that too much right now. You can look into it if you're interested. But I'm worried about the actual numbers. So I have to convert this to a number and then compare it. You have to be really careful in Python because it can let you do comparisons of strings and it can let a variable it be a number or a string or any of that. Then it's really important that you account for that. And so for that reason, you may want to convert inside your function a and b to floats and then whether or not you include this on the outside of the work let's run this so now if i did 10 5 it'll say 10.0 is greater than 5.0 and if i remove the float here my function will take care of it for me because inside my function i changed it to a float but now, by 10, 5, 10 is greater than 5. So once again, you got to be very careful with your data types to make sure. You can always do type of A and see, okay, this is a string. Will that work with my function? Okay, great. All right, so that's conditionals and using a function with a conditional. Now let's go into loops. So loops as we mentioned, are when you want to do something repeatedly. So for this, we have two options in Python. Uh, when you want to go through a list, you can use a for loop. So let's say you've got a list you want to go through, and you want to like print everything out in a list. Then you would use a for. If you want to continue going on, and repeating some line of code or lines so long as this condition is met then you could use a while and keeps going while it is met so while loops you have to be very careful because if you say while true and then you print one let's say if I run this it will just run forever because I said while one one is always true you know, if we do boo of one, and I just held control and press C to stop that. So wall true, if I scroll all the way up here, it'll print one, circle back, print one, circle back, print one, and just keep printing it out until I force the program to stop because it's never going to stop itself. So just a thing to be aware of. Let's see. So to print out everything in a list, we use for. So with for, we create a variable. Let's call it n in this case. And what happens is every time we go through this loop, n will be the next value in a list. So let's say I say for n is range of 0 to 100. I then do colon. And this will just, every time it goes through, it will give n the next value in this list. So I can just print out n, and then when I run this, oh, sorry. For Python, you don't want to say n equals range. You want to say n in 
and then whatever list you're talking about. So I run this, I do 10, and then it goes through, and I'm just going to comment this out now so that I don't have to do inputs every time. And again, if I run this, it starts at zero, so I can see exactly what range of 0, 100 is, either by converting it to a list or by a little loop and going through every position in this matrix. So with this, it print four, and then we've got a gap so you can see when it starts. So we got to enter, and then zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and so on. And so it goes zero, come 100, and then it only goes to 99 because it stops before the 100 as we saw before. If we want it to loop while there's a condition going on, then we can do while. And this is checking is a condition met? If so, then keep doing it, right? As we said. So let's say we want to start at some input and then add one to it, print that out until we get to a certain number. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say as input and the colon space so it's easier to see that I'm expecting an input in the shell here. Then I could do while val is less than, and I'm just in the habit of doing the parentheses. It would work without it, but just more parentheses is often better than less. So just be on the safe side. Val less than, and let's say we want to go till it's 100. So I'll say enter number less than 100, just because that's what I want from the user. Python doesn't know when I say in the string enter a number less than 100. It doesn't like limit my input to only be a number less than 100. This is just me pleading with the user, please enter a number less than 100. That's what my program is designed for. So I specify there enter a number less than 100. And then I say wall val less than 100. It will enter it and I'll say val plus equal one. I want to add one to it each time. And then I want to print out val. And then that's all I want to do this loop. So as it goes through, it will say, is val less than 100? If they did enter a number less than 100, then that will be true. Then it goes val plus equal one. So let's say I entered 10. It'll check. Is it less than 100? Yes. Then val will be 11 and it'll print 11. Then it reaches the end of the loop. And so it will circle back and do this while check the condition again. So 11, is this less than 100? Yes. So it goes in. It says all the lines as one. So it'll be 12, print 12, and circle back. OK, check. Is 12 less than 100? Of course it is. And so it'll keep going. And it'll print out to 10. Of course, I need to convert it to a new value here. It will print out 11 because if I wanted it to print out 10, then I would need to print val before val plus equal 1, or I could print it out here. And then, there we go, I print out, I print out my initial 10, then once I go into the loop, at the end of the loop, I got to 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and go all the way up to 100. And it'll go up to 100 because it'll print out the value. And then when it enters, every time it goes in here, by the time it gets to 99, it'll check 99 is less than 100. So it'll add one to it, which is now 100. And then it'll print out the 100. And then when it circles back, it's no longer less than 100. So that's why it actually printed out the 100. Another thing with loops is that you can include a break. So if you wanted this to break out if, let's say we have another value, val2 is 50, and we want to say if val2 is 50, then break. And this is putting an if inside a while, but that works perfectly fine. You just have to be careful with the indentation. So because this 
if is indented, you need the break indented twice so that it knows it's inside this if. And this break will just say, if it gets to this point, then break out of this loop immediately. So break, once it gets to this, it'll just end the loop right there. There's also continue. What continue does is if you had a bunch of other code, you have about two is 50 in here. Let's say about two is 51 right now. Then we have about two is 50. Then we can say if about two is 50, continue. Continue will just mean stop going through this iteration of the loop, circle back, and do the check again. If the check is true, then do this loop one more time. If not, then continue on like normal. So that's continue versus break. Again, if I did break here, it would not go back and check the condition. It would just end the loop right there and continue on with the code. So that's how function, conditions, and loops work. Let's throw all of them together now. Let's first do function with a loop. And let's say we have some list and we want to add a scalar to it. So we have like one, three, four, and we want to add that to 11. We can make a function for this where we have diff or def define function list plus val. And then we give it a list and a val. And because list is purple, I don't want to actually call it list. So I'll say list underscore this is a common way. Anytime you have like, if you wanted to name a bit a uh, variable while, you just add an underscore at the end and it will work just fine. So I'll just call it list underscore comma val colon. And then inside this function, I want it to go through every position and list and add value to it. So first what I'm going to do, I'm going to say list two is list. So right now it's just a copy of list. Then I can say or loc, just short for location, just my choice of uh, naming the variable so it makes sense for me. You could do location, type this if you want it, as long as to you that means location. But because you never know if you want to ask somebody for help with your code and you've got all these weird variable names and they have no idea what they mean, that only hinders. So you always want to stick with variable names that make sense. Oops, I don't do an equal. With a four, I do an in. And I'm going to say range of zero len of this two. Pull and enter. And this will just say loc will first be zero, then go all the way to exclude the actual length. Uh, but if I were to call up uh, three, length of A is three, but the position here is two because I started zero. So this will be zero, one, two, three, four, five, all the way to the final position or the final index. They call it the actual location of this number in here. So this will go through everything in list, which is what I care about. Maybe list or list two because they're the same right now. And I could say list two and then bracket at that location is list two at that location. And then what was this? I wanted to add val to. Then I can return list two. And we walk through this. It will take in two inputs, a list and a value. And list two, I'll just start it so that it equals list to start with. And then I'll go through every location and list. So I'll say from zero to length of list two or list. And then list two at that location is list two at that location plus val. And then I'll return that list two. So save this, run it. Oh, that's my condition. Of course, I need a double equal. I mean error. Enter a number less than 100. Let's say I do 101 for this off. It will just do 
uh, print of the vowel, it will never get into the while loop, but it won't cause an error or anything. And then I defined this. So now if I use this function list plus vowel or and let's add 10 to it. Does it work? Indeed, it does. Now 10 or sorry, 11, 12, 13, 14. Perfect. Bye. I did zero to ten. Ten to it. That will give an error on the other hand because a range object does not support item assignment. To cloak. Well, it's because I didn't make this a list. So if I said a is range of zero ten, and then I tried to make the first value in A to be 11, it'll give an error because right now type of A is range, not list. So in range, I can't override the first value in it with 11. So I've got to convert it to a list first, and then I can go through it like a list. This now, where I made it a list, one, and do the same thing. Now I've got 10, so it goes 0 to 9, right? 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. But instead it's 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 18, 19. So that's a way to create a function to add a scalar value to some list, which provides some nice functionality, what we really didn't have before. Let's now look at one that includes a function with a condition and the way we can call this one let's say we want to add a matrix plus val so now we fit in matrix and eval and i'll call it matrix eval because that makes sense then i can have a list one two three a matrix would be one, two, three, would be a list within a list, right? A list of lists where this is like the first row within my matrix, and then this is the second row. Oops. Three, six. So then I could call up the first row with bracket zero bracket, right? Just to visualize this, then of course I defined that list one, two, three, four, five, six. And just to think about how that looks in matrix form, we could go up one, two, three, four, five, six. Let's say this is A. It will be this visually to us. And you could call up the first row with bracket row bracket. And then you can call up the column with bracket column bracket. Because the row, you've got a 0 and 1, 0, 1. And then with column, it's inside that row list. You've got each element. So you got 0, 1, 2. So if I wanted to call up this, I would have A. Now I'll call up the row, which is the first, so it's zero, and the column, which is the second, which is one. If I go back to Python. So with the matrix, I could have a list of lists, or let's say I just have a list. I want to be able to handle either case. So I want the matrix plus file to be able to handle a list in here, or a list of lists. To be my matrix. Now I could say a is three six a zero one. So what we're looking at, right? Yes. So one will give us that two. So perfect. Just like we were hoping for. Let's get that over so you can see. A of uh, zero one, and we got out two. Okay. 
we want to be able to do a matrix instead. So we want to say, again, start list two is list, but we got matrix in this case. And then we want to check if it's a list just with numbers in it, like we used up here, or if it's a list of lists. So it's got the rows and columns as if it were a matrix. Then I could say if, and it's a type of, and if I do type of list, one, two, three, it's class list. So to check if something is a list, I could either do something like take the string of the output of this type of the list and make that equal to the string of the type of the thing I want to check. Or I can just check if the type of a list matches the type of the variable I'm trying to check. So if type of list two, but I don't want to look at just list two. Either way, list two is a list. It's just a question if it's a list of lists. So I'll look at the first element in list two. And the first element in list two is that a list. Then if it is, then I want to go through row in range of zero length of list two. Go through each of the rows, so the length of the elements inside list two. But we also have lists within list two. So we want to go through the columns range of zero length of list two. But the first element in this two, the length of that. So then this two at R and C, it's like we saw before, it's row and column, equals, and this will be the current value, list two at R, R, C, and add that to val. And when I'm done with those for loops, I can return list two. Okay? And that will mean I'm done with my function, but I've already gone through all of the rows and columns because I have the loops above it, and then I unindent it to that first loop. But that's only if it's lists of lists, right? So if it's not, like if it's just a list of numbers, not just got a whole bunch of lists inside it, then else, I just want to do the same thing as here and before, and I can select this format, uh, format paragraph indent region, and now it matches. So for loc in range of zero length of list two, because it's just got numbers in it, presumably. And then list two at location is list two at location plus val. So if it's not got lists in the lists, then just do the same thing as before. So let's create this and let's time. And now if I do matrix plus val first, let's feed in one, two, three, 10. And let's see if that does what we want. Okay, it does. So it went in here, it said, this two is three. Then it said, if type of this two of zero equals type of one, two, three. And, and I'm just illustrating this. So I'll just have it print out if that's true. And I could just actually not even do a if, I can just do the type equals that type. This is false because the type of list two of zero will in fact be numerical and it's just an integer because it didn't have a decimal point here. So that does not match that. So it goes to the else and it just like before goes through all the positions in list two and adds val to each of those spots and then returns list two. And in either case, it returns list two. 
So realistically, I could just, outside of all this, do return to, and I could comment out these, and it would do the same thing. So yeah, I can run it, and that's exactly what it's going to do. Now let's see if it works well with a matrix. So matrix plus val. If I have the matrix I was doing with before, one, two, three, four, five, six. Now I want to add 11. Let's add 100 to that. So you get 101, 102, 103, comma, 104, 105, 106. And that's exactly what I would expect. So this makes it very easy. Of course, I don't actually need to do this. I could do plus equal val and in here plus equal val and I could create a another function for multiplication with a scalar another function for division all that stuff so that's how you can use functions as I said you just got to make sure your indentation is correct so anything indented here from the if will be included in the if and it'll only run this is true anything inside the loop will only be a part of the loop and will repeat if the loop is repeating and anything matching the indentation just runs after the loop is done so that's how all of this works hope you learned a lot and thanks for watching